Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Why don't we stand? And let's bow our hearts to the Lord. Lord, sometimes it's nice just to hear the silence that you bring, Lord God, especially to our hearts, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would quiet our hearts this morning as we come into your presence, Lord God, that we, as we experience your love, Lord God. We pray, Lord, for our time of worship and adoration, Lord God, that this be a special time that we come into your presence and our hearts would become one with you, Lord. And Father, that we would acknowledge our need for you, Lord, and that blessing of praise and worship, Lord God. And we would choose to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth this morning. Pray for, Father, our time with you, Lord God. May you be the center, Lord. May we look to you in all things. May we entrust you, God, with anything that would, Father, hinder us from coming into your presence, Lord God. And we look forward to what you're going to do within us, Lord God. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.
comments and say good morning and share his love.
Father, I can't imagine being anywhere besides here this morning, Lord God. Because this is where you have brought us, Lord. And we thank you this morning that you brought us into your presence, Lord God, into your love. There's nothing like being in the presence of the living God. And Lord, we've worshiped you this morning. We've praised you, Lord God. And we've given thanks to you, Lord God. But we also pray, Lord, that, Father, you would speak to us now, Lord God. Hear the hearts of your people, Lord God, especially those who cry out to you this morning, Lord. Glorify yourself through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. That's easy for him to say. We are in the book of Acts, I'm sorry, book of John 21. We'll be in Acts next week. So read ahead if you can, please. Chapter one. But well, we are going to finish the book of John this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 21. And every time I get in the pulpit, every time I learn the scripture, every time I study, I feel it's like one of those moments of, please listen, this is important for you today. <laughs> but it's like that every time I get into the Bible. So it's kind of like, nah. So I want to encourage you to please listen today. It's, it's an awesome teaching, I think. Let's read John. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And this way he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast now, they cast, and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish. Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubics, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come, eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter grieved 
because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. And when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. By what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple to whom Jesus loved following, whom he had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that ye remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Okay, we're done with the book of John. It's all over. Almost. In the last chapter, we saw Jesus arise from the dead. No one had ever done anything like this under his own power arise from the dead. Jesus appears to his disciples and appears to many people. In one place in the book of Acts, it says that he appeared to over 500 people at one time. So we have proven the resurrection that it is a fact, not just a pie in the sky, but a proven truth of one of the pillars of your salvation. And we taught last week that it is one of your pillars. You must believe that Jesus rose from the dead. It's part of that gift of salvation. But just a reminder, because Jesus rose from the dead, every one of you, if you die before the Lord comes back, will also be risen from the dead. Many of you have people that you know and love that have gone to be with the Lord. And if God chooses to do the rapture of the church in the next couple of years, you and I will meet those people in the air who will have glorified bodies, spanking brand new bodies. Amen. You don't need them. <laughs> Kidding but brand new glorified bodies that can walk through walls, see through walls, travel instantly. I better be careful on this one. They are today in science at the very edge of the door to be able to transport people. Seems unreal. But I want to remind you what, G, what God said in the Old Testament that man, if he puts his mind to it, you remember what he said? Can accomplish anything. That was God's words. So they'll be given, and you and I, if we die, we'll, be have, we'll have glorified bodies. So we can look at death a lot different than people who do not know God. And that's where we left off, the resurrection. Well, let's start on verse 1. And these things, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Tiberias in a way that he showed himself. Simon Peter, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. So we see seven of his disciples together. This is a different time that he visited his 
or appears to these disciples, and it's for a specific reason. You'll see in just a moment. In verse 3, it says, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going also with you. They went into and went out and immediately got into the boat that they might, that, that that night they caught nothing. So I want you to notice something that's really important. Jesus hasn't appeared. He has told them to meet him. Or he's told, I'm sorry, he told his Mary to tell his disciples to meet him in Galilee. They go there. But Jesus isn't there, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and he doesn't show up. He doesn't come. So what they do is they go back to their old life. Peter had been a fisherman before he ever met Jesus. This is the way he made his livelihood. This was his life. And no doubt he probably enjoyed it. He inherited from his father, his father's father, his father's father's father, his grandpa's. He was fishing when Jesus called him to leave his nets and to follow him. And Jesus made this statement to him. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you fishers of men. In other words, I'm going to make you bring many people to me. And they had no doubt waited for Jesus and went back to their old life. He probably thought this is probably all over. It, is a, it was a great time. It was a marvelous experience. It was an exciting life. Seeing all of these things for three and a half or three years. but we're going to go back and do what we used to do. I want you to notice when they went back, they caught nothing. These are expert fishermen. They've been doing it all their lives. But the Lord had given them orders to fish for men, not to go back to being fishermen. The fact they caught nothing indicates we can expect God or we can expect God to bless us when we are run in a place where God doesn't want us to run to. The Bible teaches without me, you can do nothing in John 15. Now, it says in verse four, and when then the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? Now they're about 100 yards out, maybe 150 yards out, and Jesus is talking to them from the shore. And he asked them, do you have any food? They answer him, no. And he said to them, cast the nets on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of the fish. Beloved, sometimes we can get discouraged and feel like the disciples after fishing all night and catching nothing. But Jesus will many times tell us what, we told his, what he told his disciples to cast their nets on the other side. Now listen, be obedient no matter how you feel or what you think, and you'll get different results. Now, here's that bad word for Christians. I'm kidding. Obedience. Even though they had fished most of the night, When they obeyed God, it paid off. Obedience to God's word always brings blessing. I'm going to say it to you again. 
Obedience to God's word always brings blessing. Let me give you an example. Matthew 6.33 says this, and you know it well. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Thomas Kempis wrote this. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Hmm. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. Look at me. Give me your attention. Before we go on, and we're going to send on obedience for a couple minutes, how obedient are you to God's word? Be honest this morning. First question. The second question is, what is God calling you to obey concerning the scripture in your life? And I say this with this thought in mind. God has intended blessings for your life if you will obey him. Now, Arabian horses go through rigorous training in the desert in the Middle East. Their trainers require absolute obedience from their horses and test them to see if they are completely trained. The final test is almost beyond endurance of any living thing. The trainer forces the horses to do without water for many days. Then he turns them loose, and of course, they start running toward the water. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge in and drink, the trainer blows a whistle. The horses who have been completely trained and have learned perfect obedience stop. They turn around and come pacing back to their trainer. They stand there quivering, wanting water, but their weight is perfect obedience. When the trainer is sure that he has their obedience, he gives them a signal to go back to drink. Now, this may seem severe, but when you are on the track, this desert of Arabia, and your life is entrusted to a horse, you had better have a trained, obedient horse. We also must accept God's training and obey him. It has been told that when Edward V of King England in the 16th century attended a worship service, he stood while the word of God was read. He took notes during this time and later studied them with great care. Through the week, he earnestly tried to apply them to his life. That's a kind of serious-minded response to the truth the Apostle James calls for today. A single revealed fact cherished in the heart and acted upon is more vital to our growth than a head filled with lofty ideas about God. One step forward in obedience is worth years of study about it. I know a young man that I've been sharing the gospel with and sharing the word of God with for years. And after I've shared something with him, he says the same thing every single time, for sure. And I haven't seen him apply anything that I've shared with him concerning the word of God. And for sure, it means, at least I think it means this. Yeah, what you're saying is right. I need to do that. I'm going to do it. And we as Christians can be for sure people, just like this young man. We can say, yes, I need to do that. Yes, I need to apply God's word to my life in this area. Yes, I need to do this as a wife or a husband. I need to do this for sure. But unless we do it, it's not for sure. It's just words. Now, sometimes we think that obedience is not that important. 
that we can get away with being partially obedient, but partial obedience is disobedience. So why should we be obedient to God? Because when we are obedient, we are saying to God, I trust you, and what you are telling me is right, and not only right, but also what is best for me. When I don't obey God's word, I am telling God, what you are saying is wrong, and I know what is right. Is that really what you want to do this morning when God says to you, I want you to do this. I want you to be obedient to this because I have blessings in your life. And you say to God, well, I, don't, I'm, I can't do that right now. What you're saying to God is, God, you're wrong on this. And I will say this to you to this morning. God is never wrong. He can't be wrong. If he is wrong, he's not God. Again, I say to you, obedience to God's word brings blessing. Disobedience brings loss of blessing. For example, God tells me to pray, and he tells you to pray. Why? So I can come and have fellowship with God and intimacy with him. And there's nothing better than that. It doesn't get any better. Then, as I am having fellowship with God, I can tell him what bothers me and release to him and allow him to take care of them. But if I say to God, I don't have time to pray, I miss the intimacy of being with God, the God of creation. And I will carry the load of my worries and be anxious the whole day which will affect the quality of my day and life. I want to say this, I have children and I have grandchildren. They don't live here in Clear Lake. They don't live in Lake County. They're traveling constantly, my older sons. And I never worry about them. You may think, oh, come on, pastor. Very simply, I don't worry about them. Let me tell you why. Because every day in the morning and every day at night, I go to my God and your God, and I put this into practice. I lay my children and the protective hand of God upon them as I pray. And so wherever they go, I know that whatever God allows is perfect. I don't carry them, but I carry them to God. And there's where freedom comes. If you are worried or anxious about someone, then you need to go to God, and God will bless you, and you won't be carrying the weight of people or your job or whatever it may be, a sickness. Whatever it may be, if you'll carry it to God, you'll be able to walk in freedom. And let me say this to you. Some of you carry the future of what's going to happen in our world today. What's happening over in Ukraine? What's happening wherever it may be? If you will come to God and you will release those things to God that have burdened you, God makes a promise. You can have rest. Prayer is not a burden, but a blessing. I want to remind you what Jesus said. To come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that true? Is Jesus telling us the truth this morning concerning our lives? If we will do this, Jesus says this is what will happen. You lose out when you are not obedient to God's word. I want, to listen, I want you to listen to Luke chapter 11, verse 27. It says this. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And listen to what Jesus responds to her. 
More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. James 1, verse 21 says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness, overcoming, overflowing of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any was a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, not bondage, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Obedience keeps us from sin and its bondage and keeps us on the path of God's blessing. Now, I want to read a scripture to you. This is concerning the nation of Israel itself. And I believe that any nation, and I believe America was in this exact same place and this same promise. It's in Deuteronomy 28, and it says this. If you will fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all the commandments that I have given you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all the blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and your flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and your breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord will God will bless you in the land he has given you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you on his holy people and as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time for the, his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless all the work that you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you will always be on top and never on the bottom. You must not turn away from any of the commandments I am giving you today, nor follow after other gods and worship them. But if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and you do not obey all the commandments and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon and overwhelm you. Now let me share this with you before we go on, talking about obedience. But I'm talking, put this in here specifically as, as, as a nation. Israel as a nation was blessed by God. During many of the times of Judah, when Judah was controlling, they had godly kings Kings that love God and walk with God. God. Kings like Josiah. Kings like Hezekiah. These men followed the word of God, obeyed the word of God, led the people to obey God. And many of the blessings that we're talking about here is exactly what happened to them as a nation. God was true to his word, but God was also true to his word when the Israel and Judah went and strayed and went to false gods. And they were captiv captivated. Babylon took them one time. And they were captured many times because they disobeyed the word of God. The United States of America, where you and I live, at one time obeyed the word of God greatly. 
and God bless us as a nation, and all these things more or less, maybe not to the fulfillment that God wanted, but many of them are fulfilled in us as a nation. God blessed us. We've never been more blessed than any other nation. No nation has been blessed like the United States. Even Israel, it's true. And you and I are blessed by God to be born in America. But those blessings are just about over. And we're headed for a curse on our nation. We have $30 trillion now in debt. $30 trillion. And it keeps on growing. And you name the sin, it's promoted and accepted as normal. And God says it's an abomination to me. It is. And so what God breaks a promise to this nation as he makes a promise to us today, because of this obedience to the word of God, this has to happen to us as a nation. I don't know how far we have to go, or down we will go, but we will go down. Not because God's angry, but because God says this is the result of disobedience. Now let's take it to our own personal lives. There are things that will also happen concerning what God's word says. Even if you belong to God, God will chasten you. God will allow you to sow and reap. God wants you to be obedient to the word of God. Why? It all comes down to the blessings that God wants on your life. It's how you look at obedience concerning disobedience. If I look at obedience as God wants to love me and bless me, and he wants all these things in my life, he wants me to have this good marriage, this good relationship, this good being good with my children, being good in my job, if God wants all these things, if that's true, then I will obey God if I believe that. But I, if I think, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. God doesn't really care if I'm obedient or not. He's still going to love me. It's true. God is still going to love you. But you're not going to reap the blessings in your life that God desires for you to have as one of his children. That's how it works. Some people say, God doesn't care if you're not obedient. This is the furthest thing from the truth I want to say this with that thought in mind. We must remember that we have a relationship with God. When something is done to hurt that relationship, God works toward restoring that relationship, and that means whatever it takes. Remember, a relationship is between two people, both doing their part. Let me share this with that same thought, obedience, and I'll stop there. Did you know that when we disobey God, we are fighting against God? No one loves you the way God does. He wants only good for you. His plan for your life is a superior to yours. If you've been fighting against him, the wisest thing you can do is surrender. Stop kicking against the goads. Yield yourself to God and let him begin to work out the plan he has for your life. Let me say this with that same thought, no matter how old you are. I never get to an age when I can say, I don't have to obey God no more. That was when I was young. I had those problems. And I had a problem with sin when I was younger. Let me say this to you. I wish it was when you got a certain age, you never dealt with sin anymore. You never thought about sin. You were never tempted. The temptations just become different as you get older. Now, 
We talked about obedience, but I want to talk about another point concerning the same thought concerning his disciples and what they were dealing with. And that is this, they, I believe they got depressed. I believe they went fishing and went back to their old occupation, partly because maybe they got depressed of waiting for Jesus, he didn't show up. I'm gonna go do what I normally do. So I want to touch on just a moment this thing called depression because a lot of people are dealing with it. John Hoskins Hospital brought out a survey this last week that said this, more people have died by being isolated and in homes than the virus itself. That is findings from John Hopkins Hospital this week. Which John Hopkins Hospital is not no little teeny hospital. They're one of the best in the world. One of the leaders. So what we thought, not we, but what some people thought and said was science has done more damage and killed more people and brought them into depression and even some to suicide because they thought they knew. So something, this thing called depression, you and I are all going to have to deal with it sometime in our life. Some more than others. The Bible gives us a good example of a man who dealt with depression and became very depressed. And you would think, how can a man like that get depressed? But his name was Elijah. Let me read the scripture to you about him. The great man of God, 1 Kings 19, 3 and 4 says, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while well, he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom there, a broom tree, I'm sorry, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Now, I'm not going to ask you this question about if you've ever been here before or if you ever thought this in your mind because every single one of you in this room have thought this. I'm not saying that it was a long time or you meditated on it, but the thought comes through your mind, every single person. That's how it works. Let me share with you about this man, Elijah. He had been used greatly by God previously. He had called down fire from heaven to consume the altar of sacrifice and all the water that was poured on it. He had put to death 850 false prophets of Baal. He had prayed for rain after three years of drought, and God answered him. But he had been threatened by Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. So he runs away approximately 90 miles. And he isolates himself, and he gets himself in this place and asks God to take his life. I think you could say he was depressed. What do you think? <laughs> there are a few things that cause Elijah to get depressed. Let me share them with you. First, he listened to the lies of an enemy. Second, he allowed fear to captivate his heart. Third, he got his eyes on himself. And fourth, he got his eyes on off of God and on another, Jezebel. And last but not least, he was emotionally and physically exhausted. When these five took hold of him, before he knew it, he wanted to die, and this can happen to us. So what should we do when we face depression? 
We need to carefully, number one, we need to be careful to whom we listen to, and that includes our own mind. I want to read to you a scripture in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 6 and 7. It says this, For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the cardinal mind is the enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So my thoughts are, be careful who you listen to. That includes people, that includes the news, that includes what you watch on TV, that includes friends, haven't you ever listened to someone and they have totally depressed you? Man, I can't be around that person anymore. Man, they depress me. All they have is negative drama. I hate drama. I don't have to ha hardly ever listen to it, but when I do, it's like, ugh. Let me go take a spiritual bath. But I also want to remind you not to listen to yourself. Your carnal mind, your way you think, your old nature, if you let that take control and you start believing your thinking, you're in trouble. The Bible says, take your thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Let's look at the second one. He allowed fear to captivate his heart. When fear is allowed to grow in one's heart, who knows what one will do or not do? Deal with small fears before they become big fears. Remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. The third one, he got his eyes on himself. Watch out. He started to look inside himself. Maybe poor me or why me? I thought God loved me. Woe is me. Every one of you this morning has been here, including myself. Beloved, there are times of introspect when God is dealing with some sin in our hearts, but God does not want our eyes on ourselves. If you do, you're going to get consumed by yourself. And that's what the natural man does. Don't look in, look up. Fourthly, he got his eyes off God and on Jezebel. Don't look at people or circumstances without keeping your eyes on God and his faithfulness. And last but not least, his emotional and physical, he was exhausted. He had been spent. Most of you probably don't know what this is, but I'm going to tell you what it is. It's called an all-nighter. How many of you know what that is? Please raise your hand. A few of you do, all-nighter. It means I stayed up all night and did what I needed to do, and I got it all accomplished. And after that all-nighter, you look like... <laughs> and that's when you're in trouble. You're exhausted. And you could even be doing it for the Lord. I did it for the Lord. And when that happens, you need to rest. You need to be wise. And when you rest and when you know emotionally, you need to be comforted and strengthened through the Word of God. If not, you're going to get depressed. That's how it works. I've heard people say this to me. I was doing the Lord's work, and boy, I'm just exhausted. Yeah, take a break. That doesn't mean go walk in your flesh. That's not what I'm saying. Go read God's Word and meditate on the Word of God. Get replenished from the Word of God. A wonderful scripture. An antidepressant is Psalms 42. It helps a whole bunch. Now, he goes on. Verse 7, Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunges into the sea. So he's, a, he's fishing in his underwear, so to say. He really is. He puts on his outer garment, and he jumps in because he sees the Lord, and he wants to be with the Lord. 
Verse 8, but the other disciples came in the little boat where they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, and 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to him, come, eat breakfast. And none of his disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord Jesus, they came and they took the bread, and they gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. So Jesus specifically asked Peter, do you love me more than these? So what are these? Perhaps 153 fish in the net, which would represent success, our security, or the good life. Or perhaps it was the other six sitting there. Peter has asked this question, do you love me? The word literally means agape me. It is a word for deep love used of God's divine love. It is a supreme love, it is a giving love, a love based on making a choice to value a person, not based on emotions, but on the will. It is a deep, divine, fervent, total love. And the Bible teaches, really, that God is not satisfied with anything less than agape love. This love that is talking about here is love of actions. It is not a love of feelings or just words. Many people think that if I say I love you, that's enough. And there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that God wants us to say that. But I believe it must be in our hearts, first of all, and it must be God's love that we're talking about. When you became a Christian, in the book of Romans, it says this, that God shed his love abroad in your heart, Romans 5, 5. So in other words, God equipped you to love other people in this way. God equipped you to love him back with his own, his own personal love, to, so to say. Now it's a choice. Am I going to will to love God? And Jesus more or less says to Peter, and if you love me, Peter, this is what I want you to do. Feed my lambs. The word feed literally means portray the duty of a Christian teacher to promote in every way the spiritual warfare or welfare of the members of the church. Now I'll say this to you. This is an awesome responsibility this is not just choosing an occupation, but this is a God choosing one's calling upon their lives. And it's a huge responsibility concerning God. In the Old Testament, there were priests. They were to represent the people to God and represent God to the people. What they would do is when God would tell them something, they would go back and tell the people, and they were to listen and to obey. Now, we who are Christians are priests also. We are to represent God to people. We are no longer need to go a go-between, a priest like the Old Testament, 
But God has given us pastors and teachers, evangelists for the edifying and the perfecting of the saints. They are gifts from God to the people. Now, what pastors are to do, they are to feed the truth of the word of God, not their opinions or the opinions of the world are what is popular to the world. They, we, are to teach the unadulterated word of God. But I must also be willing to hear and surrender my will over to God's. We are not just to come to church and hear God's teaching. We are to be students of the word of God, ready to take his word as a sword. So God has called Peter, so he has called men, and they are to adamantly teach only God's truth. It is an awesome responsibility that Peter is going to have, and he does fulfill it in the power of the Spirit of God. But it's also an awesome responsibility for pastors who are called by God to teach the word of God wholly and in truth. But let me go further. It is your responsibility to receive the word of God and obey the word of God. That's what it teaches. Now, every time that you hear the word of God, it doesn't mean that you are going to like what you hear. It isn't going to always make you feel good. In fact, it may make you weep. It may make you cry. Sometimes the word of God makes us look in the mirror and we don't like what we see. Other times it makes us look in the mirror and we see what God has done and we like what we see. But you need to weigh the word of God every time it's taught. God, what are you saying to me? What are you working in me? Is there anything that you want me to know concerning this? And then you must have a heart that says, I'm willing to obey you, God. Not the pastor, but the word of God. Now, Jesus repeats himself. And he says in verse 17, 16, and he said to him again, the second time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. This word is different than the first one, of feed. It means a furnished pasture for food, to serve the body, to supply the requisites for the soul that's needed. And then it says to discipline. Hmm. So what he's really telling Peter is to watch over my sheep, to be a shepherd over my sheep, to take care of my sheep in every way. Now this doesn't mean that you're supposed to control their lives. This doesn't mean that you need to be a shepherding belief in the sense of there is a belief that one is supposed to be a shepherd and they control your life. That's so foolish. You have a relationship with God yourself. And you can go to God any time, just like any pastor. But you are to allow them to shepherd you concerning the truth of God and to, at times, be disciplined. That's how it works. Now, listen to this. It's called God Gives Us Men. God gives us men ribbed with the steel of the Holy Spirit. Men who will not finch flinch when the battle is fierce. Men who won't agree quietly or compromise or fade when the enemy rages. God give us men who can't be bought, bartered, or badgered by the enemy. Men who will pay the price, make the sacrifice, stand the ground, and hold the torch high. God give us men obsessed with the principle true to your word. Men stripped of self-seeking and a yearn for security. 
Men who will pay any price for freedom and go any length for truth. God, give us men delivered for, from mediocrity, men with vision, pride low, faith wide, low de love deep, and patiently long, men who will dare to march to the drumbeat of a distant, a distant drummer, men who will not surrender principles of truth in order to accommodate their peers. God, give us men more interested in scars than medals, more committed to conviction than convenience, men who will give their life for the eternal instead of indulging their lives for a moment in time. Give us men who are fearless in the face of danger, calm in the midst of pressure, bold in the midst of opposition. God, give us men who will pray earnestly, work hard, or work long, preach clearly, and wait patiently. Give us men who walk in by, is by faith, behavior is by principle, whose dreams are in heaven, and whose book is the Bible. God, give us men who are equal to the task. These are the men the church needs today. Just a little bit more and we're done. And he said to him, verse 17, the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him again, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says to Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. So we see Jesus telling Peter that he is going to be crucified. When you were young, you dressed yourself, Jesus says, and when you were where you wanted. But one of these days, others are going to dress you and they're going to take you where you don't want to go. They're going to take you to a cross, Peter. And sure enough, in years to come, when Peter was in Rome, he was sentenced to death on a cross. But Peter said, I have one request. Please crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die as my Lord. And he was crucified. Verse 19, this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And Peter turned around and saw his disciples whom Jesus loved following, who had leaned on his breast at the supper. And he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it wills that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So what Jesus is really saying in this part of the verses is don't worry about others. You do what I've shared or told you to do, what I've called you to do. Don't worry about others. Don't get distracted. And he ends the teaching in verse 23 through 25. Then the saying went out among the brethren that his disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things. And we know that this testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So let me refresh real quickly and we're done. Let me remind you. We see God working in these men, but he speaks to them about obedience. Has God spoken to you this morning about something you need to be obedient to God concerning the word of God? If he, if he has, then you need to yield to him. Remember why God wants you to be obedient. He has blessings for you in that area concerning your life. And then we see the calling of Peter to feed his sheep. 
And then we saw about depression, how one gets depressed. It's important that this morning we recognize whatever God wants us to recognize and what he's done or spoke to us. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, we are grateful that the living God, the only true God, or there is no other, Lord, the one that raised, has been risen from the dead, the one that lives inside of us and loves us, has spoken to us. And Father, we, we don't take your words lightly. We receive them as one of your children that you love, God that you desire to bless, Lord God. So I pray this morning, Lord God, if there's something that you have called us or been working within our own hearts concerning that we need to obey you in, Lord God, may we surrender to you in that area, God. And may the blessings that you desire to flow into our lives and flow into our hearts, God, may they be received this morning either right now, Lord, or in your timing and in your way, God. And Father, I want to lift up those who maybe have been going through a time of depression, God, dealing with depression, God. And I'm asking in Jesus' name, Lord God, that you would get our eyes fixed on you, our hearts turned toward you, Lord. Maybe the things that we've listened to that are contrary to you, you remove them, Lord. And put thoughts of you in our hearts and in our minds, Lord God. We thank you, God, that through the word of God, you have all the answers, Lord. And we thank you for speaking to our heart and working in us, Lord God. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let us stand this morning. If we need prayer, we'll have people up here, pastors up here. Sometimes after a message like this, a teaching like this, we want to stay longer with God, so to say, because God's not finished working. So this morning, if you want to come up and kneel at the altar as our worship team plays, please do. If you need prayer this morning, we, again, we have pastors up here. I think Tony's up here somewhere hiding. If you want some prayer from her or you want to pray, Pastor Don to pray for you, please, let, please come up. Whatever God wants this morning, let God have this morning. That's important. So as we sing this song with our worship team, afterwards we'll be dismissed. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.